creating great content, finding an audience, building engagement, monetizing your blog. This is Pro Blogger. Hey there, friends, Darren here from ProBlogger. I wanted to do a quick Facebook Live today. Ask me anything you want session. Uh, we are talking blogging, online entrepreneurship, streaming, anything that you think I might be able to help you with. If you're watching us live, I'd love it if you would introduce yourself. Let me know if you can hear me okay and uh, feel free to pop in uh, your location and a URL, your blog topic if you've got one. Say g'day, let us know that you are there live. If you're watching on the replay, you're welcome to introduce yourself as well and ask any question that you might have. All I ask is that you put question at the start of your question so that I can kind of uh, have my eye drawn to that and uh, I'll do my best to answer anything that you've got. I can see you, uh, Bogor. Nice to see you watching on Periscope or Twitter. Good to have you with us. Feel free to pop in any questions that you've got. Let us know where you're watching from as well. There's no topic that I won't attempt an answer on today. Now, I am using a bit of a new microphone setup today, testing some new things, so I would love it if you'd let me know if you can hear me, how the, cl um, the clarity of the microphone is this morning. Good to see you there, Simon in Melbourne. No questions, just good morning. Well, I hope it is a good morning for you today, Sime, and uh, nice to see you, Grove. It looks like so far, uh, most of those watching are my team members, which is kind of nice that they're here as well. Waleed, nice to see you over in Egypt. We will have people being able to watch today on Twitter, I think, um, and also on YouTube and Facebook. I'm just checking to see that we are online. Yeah, we are online in our community group on Facebook page, Periscope and we may even be live on LinkedIn for the first time. I can see it says we're live. I love it if someone jump over and check on my LinkedIn account because I thought that was a beta, a beta testing thing which I wasn't approved for. Good to see you, um, Simon, saying that it sounds uh, like I could use a little bit more bass. Well, I could talk a little bit deeper. Um, I don't have any more bass to add, but um, that is good to know. I'm going today live through the Rode Go uh, into the camera. So I'm not sure how I'm gonna add a bit more bass in, but I'll give it a go. Okay, so I've got a question in from the Facebook group. Unfortunately, I can't actually see your names when you comment in the Facebook group, so apologies for not featuring your name. But uh, the question is, are you going to bring back podcasts more regularly? That is in the plan. Um, but at the moment, I've been doing a little bit more in the Facebook live realm. Um, we are planning some new content uh, coming out and in course work and also in some sprints and some of that will be able to be put up onto the podcast as well. So hopefully uh, we'll get that in order. Okay, question coming in from Bagore. My question is, what do you think is the future of blogging? Do you think it is something someone can... Second part of the question, make a living off in the next seven to 10 years. Yeah, I do think uh, it's possible to make a living from blogging even if you're just starting from scratch today. Blogging has changed uh, and it's continually changed since I started blogging. When I started blogging back in 2002, it was all text. There were no images, hardly any images at least, and certainly no video. Um, There's no Instagram, Facebook, anything like that. Obviously, we now have so many different places that you can create content and post your content and share your content. There's different mediums as well. And so blogging has evolved. And what I'm seeing more and more is bloggers doing um, video using much more in the way of imagery and of course promoting their blogs into different streams as well. Most bloggers have at least one social media stream that they prefer to pump their content out onto. And so you need to embrace a little bit more 
and um, and but certainly blogging is here to stay, I, and I think the written word is here to stay. There, the reality is some people really prefer video content, some people prefer audio content, and some people really prefer to read. And so um, you may not be able to reach everyone with the written word, but certainly um, you're able to reach a good proportion of uh, the audience as well. Kushal, nice to see you tuning in from India. Good to have you with us. I hope you are doing well. And Haley as well, nice to see you. Okay, uh, it is Delaney, by the way. Good. Thank you um, for letting us know your name. If you are watching in the Facebook group and you want to ask a question, just pop your name um, because, unfortunately, I'm using Ecamm and Facebook groups don't actually communicate with Ecamm so well um, unless you kind of give it, um, jump through some hoops. Good to see you, Larry, joining with us today. Question regarding domain authority. Is country TLD such as IE? A disadvantage. Um, I think if you are trying to reach a specific audience in a specific location, um, then having your local country's TLD um, is perhaps an advantage. Um, if you are trying to reach a global audience, I would avoid using the local um, domain names um, and go with a .com uh, if possible. Um, or a .net or, or one of the other ones. Um, but if you're an Australian trying to reach an Australian audience, go with a .com.au because it's going to help you a little bit as far as I understand to rank in google.com.au. Um, so there will be some advantages there to do that. But um, as I can see, you're in the second half of your question, um, you are trying to target a global keyword search, then you'll probably want to go with a .com um, if possible, uh, if it's available. Um, uh, a .net or a dot .something else might um, give you some advantages as well. Having said that, I for a long, long time reached a global audience with a .org.au domain name. Um, that was a few years ago now, so Google may have changed their algorithm. They probably have, um, but certainly um, I did okay. And I think the, the main message is that it's um, the domain TLD is just one of many, many factors in Google's algorithm. Okay, another question there coming in from the group, might be Delaney again, I'm not sure. Are there very many risks with lawsuits with blogging, providing you're not copywriting others, etc. people trying to litigate because you're successful? Um, it is something that I have in the back of my mind. The only things that I've really seen bloggers get into trouble with is when they're doing dodgy stuff with using other people's content, particularly their images, um, so if you are respecting other people's content, you're not breaking copyright, you should be okay. Um, I've had a, f a, years and years ago now, I had one other blogger who um, was accusing me of stealing his ideas. Um, now, that was in the blogging space. We were both blogging about blogging. There's only so many things you can write about with blogging. Um, I know for a fact I wasn't reading his blog. I wasn't stealing his ideas. He felt he had a monopoly on the topic. And so anytime I wrote anything, he said, I've written about this. Um, so, and he threatened legal action, but um, didn't, didn't actually lead to anything. Um, so I guess you could potentially have some sort of a um, legal um, sort of suit brought against you uh, from someone else in your niche who, th who thinks that they were the originator of all ideas on your niche, um, but I, it's unlikely. That's the only time in, since 2002 I've ever had anyone threaten anything um, and I was able to prove, I was confident I was able to prove that I'd, I came up with all my own ideas. Um, of course, two bloggers writing about the same topic are going to write on similar sort of um, ideas. They may even have a similar view on something. Um, uh, that's, I think that's just 
the way things are. So yeah, I haven't really seen too many people run into legal troubles. You probably just want to think about trademark, um, starting a blog with a name that isn't trademarked or those types of things that may be some issues as well. Uh, good to see you, Brad, who says he's just starting. Any advice? Um, yeah, so check out our Start a Blog course um, if you haven't already done that. And if you haven't already set up your blog, check that out because it does have a lot of our advice for brand new bloggers just starting out. It's free to do. Um, you can find it over on problogger.com and look for the courses. Um, in terms of uh, advice beyond setting up the blog, which is a, a lot of that is, is covered in um, that course, I think really the main piece of advice I would give is to think about who you're trying to reach and how you're trying to change their life and create content that does that, that takes people from point A to point B or uh, part way from the change you want to bring. Most good blogs bring a change in their audience, whether it's giving them information, whether it's making them laugh when they're feeling sad, making them feel a sense of belonging when they're feeling lonely, giving them the latest news when they don't know it. Um, all of these things are some sort of a change in your reader. And if you make that sort of an impact upon someone, they're going to come back for more. So really think carefully about who you're trying to reach. It may be a certain demographic. It may be a certain um, uh, occupation. It might be a certain location. Uh, the more you can think about that and then how you're changing their life, the better. And then just try and create content that takes people on that journey. You're going to have a big change you're trying to bring. And, you know, I want to get people from point A to point B overall. So for me on ProBlogger, I want to get people from not having a blog to having a profitable blog. Uh, and so all the pieces of content take people a part way on that journey. No one piece of content is going to take people the, the whole journey um, for me. Um, but every piece of content needs to participate in that overall change I'm trying to bring. So um, that may be a helpful piece of advice uh, for you. Okay, you've got a question here from Walid. I think um, Walid was in Egypt from memory. Um, could I start a blog with two languages? Um, I have seen a few bloggers do this. Uh, and the second part of the question there was, or should I make two blogs? I personally would... Um, either have two blogs or have two categories or two sections on your blog. Um, sorry, my little microphone clip just flicked. Um, so yeah, I would probably have it all on the one domain probably and then have a like English version and Egyptian, is it, that you're wanting to write in? I'm not sure. Apologies if I've, I've got that wrong. Um, so you might have the English and you might have the Egyptian. You might have the Italian and you might have the French, um, whatever the two languages are. Um, alternatively, you could set them up on different blogs with the different domain, um, local domains. That may um, There may be some benefit in doing that as well. The downside of having two languages on your blog is keeping the quality up. So you want to make sure that you can produce high quality content, uh, either if you can speak both languages really well or you can hire someone to translate for you. Um, the, the danger would be if you're... For example, if English is your second language and, and you're not quite as proficient, um, a native English speaker is going to um, pick that. And so you really want to make sure that quality is very high on both languages. I guess the other part of it is that um, you're going to have your focus split. And so the more blogs you have or the more things you're doing on your blog, the less able you're able to serve um, each group of readers. So you want to be a little bit careful about over committing, I guess, there. Larry, uh, you are welcome. Um, Pam has a question. Do you have advice for bloggers who work a full-time day job but still need to find time to publish grow community and do promotion. Yes, um, so when I started out, that was my situation. I was working numerous part-time jobs and doing some part-time study as well. Um, and so I was blogging mainly in the mornings and the evenings, um, but I carried a notebook with me everywhere I went and I was writing down my ideas on the commute to and from work. Um, when I got a smartphone, I started um, 
creating voice notes. Uh, I was driving to work and so I couldn't write, but I could certainly record my thoughts um, as I was driving um, when it's safe to do so. Um, and so in, in many ways, what I was trying to do is to blog, blog in the spare time that I had, the downtime that I had, and capture the ideas that I had. And so I trained myself to be thinking about my blog. I was lucky enough to have a job that didn't involve too much thought. I was packing things in a warehouse for a while. I was working in an in-flight catering kitchen, putting food on trays. So I was able to put my mind to my topics. And then on my lunch break, I was able to take those ideas and put them onto a note, a piece of um, paper. Um, these days I would do it on my phone. And then when I got home, I, I had a head start, I guess. So I was doing some of the blogging um, in the kind of background of my brain. The other thing that I found really helpful was to have set times for blogging. Um, so I um, would have certain days of the week I'd get up early or I would stay up late. Um, certain nights of the week my wife would go out to do things and that would be a specific blogging time. You just have to get more organized. What I actually find is that when I've got less time to blog, I'd blog better in some ways um, because the pressure's on. Um, and the other thing I'd say is don't, don't, overreach when it comes to the frequency of posting content. You don't need to publish daily. You don't even need to publish two or three times a week. One really good piece of content a week is going to do well. So um, uh, focus on quality, not quantity. Um, and yeah, I don't know if that kind of helps at all, Pam, but um, if it doesn't, if you've got any other questions, feel free to put them in. Hey, Sherry, good to see you in the Philippines. Sherry, your um, name made Siri go off here. <laughs> Maybe I uh, slurred it a little bit. Thanks for sharing your blog URL as well. Good to see you, David, in the Facebook group. With a new blog, how long do you recommend just putting out content before trying to monetize? Um, really, it's more about how much traffic you have and probably the way you're trying to monetize as well. So there's a few factors at play. Um, you obviously do need to create um, regular content um, and, and I guess it really depends how fast your audience builds. If you have a slow build, so um, for me, Digital Photography School, my main blog today, it was a slow build. Um, readers were added one at a time. It took um, a good year or so before I really even began to think about monetizing that blog because the traffic just wasn't there. Um, I did try and monetize early, but it really didn't make any money. Um, so at the time I was using banner ads mainly, um, AdSense, um, and that method of monetizing takes a lot of traffic. And so I had to um, build up my audience. It probably wasn't for about two years before I made much from AdSense on that blog. Um, ProBlogger, for example, is, is quite different. It grew its audience really fast. Uh, it was within a month or two, once I shared that I was full-time as a blogger, back in 2004, I think it was, that I launched ProBlogger, um, that, that took off really quick because back then no one was making money from blogging. So the, the tipping point was really fast and so I would monetize a, a month or so later with the first course that I did called Six Figure Blogging, which isn't available anymore. So um, it's partly about the audience. It's also partly about the way you monetize. So AdSense, you'll need a lot of traffic. Any kind of banner advertising, you'll need a lot of traffic. If you're selling your own product and you have a really deep connection with your audience, it's much easier to monetize with less traffic. If you've got a highly engaged audience, you may only have 100 people, but if 50 people buy your course, you're gonna make a lot more money from that than you will with those 50 people on AdSense. You might make a few cents a day on AdSense with 100 or so readers. But with 100 readers that are super engaged and that really trust you, and are there for a specialized topic, um, you can monetize that a lot faster. So there's a few factors at play there. Um, I do think it is um, worthwhile experimenting with monetizing quite early on, but do it in low, um, um, in ways that don't take a lot of work. So using a banner ad, for example, or using an affiliate product where you don't have to create a product, but you can recommend someone else's. Those ways are 
fairly easy ways. There, there's low barriers to entry in, in monetizing in those ways. So that can be a good way to start out. Uh, Darren is saying, I was sued for a libelous com comment that I accidentally published, settled out of court. Okay, well, someone else was asking before there about um, monetization. And so, yeah, there's a way that you can, uh, sorry, not monetization, um, being sued. So, yeah, there are some ways, I guess, that you can um, get into trouble with that. So that's not cool. I'm sorry about that, Darren. Um, I hope it didn't cost you too much. Um, good to see you. Is it Seraj? 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 Sorry if I've mispronounced that. Semantic semantic SEO is future. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, I'm not really an SEO expert, and so I'm sorry. I'm not going to really give you too much of an opinion there because I don't really know. Um, Google just has so many factors at play with their um, algorithm. Um, I don't know, really. Sorry. Um Darren saying, have a clear comments policy and a way for people to report comments. Good advice. And having a, a policy that's published somewhere on your blog uh, is something that's probably well worth doing as well. Kushal, nice to see you. Big long question there. My blog is new and I have been building contextual backlinks for the last three months. Google is not indexing the backlinks I have built. Approximately 90% of them are not indexed. Any reason for it? What is the best way to put them in front of Google eyes. Again, not really um, a, an area of strength for my expertise, um, apart from the fact that from what I can tell, the, the longer your blog has been active, the more likely it is that Google's gonna start um, indexing things. The more times you publish on your blog, so regularity of content is a bit of a signal to Google to take note of your content as well. Um, in terms of the, the backlinks to your blog, um, Google doesn't tend to like anything that looks unnatural. So if you are building links by paying for them or um, doing something like you're swapping links with someone, Google kind of knows a lot of that. They see a lot of that and they mark some of that as far as I understand as something that they won't uh, index because they don't see it as natural. So you really want to be careful about any kind of unnatural um, building of backlinks to your site. Generally, what Google likes is, is the kind of link to your site from someone else naturally who just likes your site and is sharing it with their audience because your site is good. Um, anything that they think is a bit sus, that looks arranged, that looks artificial, um, they aren't likely to link. So be a bit careful about the way you um, build those links. I was talking to um, an SEO expert recently um, and I actually asked him about backlinks um, and he actually said that they do not build backlinks anymore as part of their service because Google just doesn't like um, those sorts of strategies anymore. So they don't actually focus on building backlinks and he's an SEO company. Um, so that um, is probably good advice. Uh, Mike, so important to capture those ideas as soon as possible. Smart, yes, I do think this is one of the big things that holds a lot of bloggers back. We have all these ideas that come through our head in the shower, on the commute to work, um, while we're watching Netflix, while we're reading a book, while we're out talking to a friend, we've got to capture them. And so this is one of the beauties of having a phone that has notes on it, um, has audio recording capabilities. Uh, you have this beautiful idea capturing advice, um, uh, idea capturing um, uh, tool at your fingertips. If you don't like those, uh, the old fashioned pen and notepad uh, by your side is probably the way to go. I used to have a little notebook. I think they're kind of, they're somewhere in, in one of these cupboards down here. I had a uh, Molluskine notebook, is that how you say it? And it was this size, I used to carry it around in my um, pocket. And that was where I jotted down all those ideas. I actually found it the other day. Um, 
It was kind of funny. It made no sense to me at all because it was all written in shorthandish type stuff. Uh, good to see you, Helia, um, from Texas. Hope you are doing well over there in the U.S., um, and I should say to everyone, I hope you are doing well. I um, Here in Australia, we're kind of, things are opening up again and starting to move again um, uh, with people going back to work, which is um, really exciting. But I understand in different parts of the world, uh, we're all at different stages of this and there's a lot going on at the moment. And so um, I kind of sometimes feel weird coming on live to talk about blogging because I, th I think it's so in many ways so inconsequential to many of the big things going on around the world with um, you know the pandemic and um, Black Lives Matter and, and all of these things and so um, I just want to say I have I'm, I'm really thinking of you all um, and I, I do these lives with a bit of hesitation almost uh, and I just want to acknowledge um, all that's going on for us all at the moment and um, you know I do think of you I pray for you and and I hope that things are going well um, for you at the moment as well and want to acknowledge the hardships that um, people are going through uh, I guess I, I just wanted to say that and I probably should have said it right up front on live today um, but we all need to pay the bills. We all need to express ourselves, tell our stories. And so um, I do these lives because I think blogging actually does have a, um, a place to play in, in the, the things that we're going through at the moment. And they can resource people who are going through tough times. They can give people a voice to share their story and to make a difference in the world. And um, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to, I guess, acknowledge all of that at the moment as well. Okay. I don't like to switch topics from that because I, 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 yeah, anyway, I am going to go back to the questions because that's what this session is about. Uh, Jason says, I'm struggling to just sit down and write blog posts. Do you have any tips on how to grind out posts when you're dealing with a bit of writer's block or something like that? I've no, I, I have ideas and I have time. I just can't grind it out at the moment. Okay. Very common question. This idea of um, writer's block, usually it comes down to one of three things. Usually it's about either not having the ideas. Sounds like you've got the ideas, so that's great. Um, secondly, it can be about the writing, the creating of that process, and that sounds like where you're at. And the third part is usually um, the finishing the, the polishing, the editing, and getting it live. And a lot of bloggers struggle with, they've got all this um, almost finished content sitting in their archive, in their drafts, but they don't actually hit publish. Sounds like you're struggling a little on that middle one of the writing or the creating of it. Um, now, the, the advice that I give most bloggers, whether they're struggling with any of those types of, of writer's block is the main thing is that you need to set aside specific time for the creation or the idea generation or the finishing of the content. That's the first part. And so if you're struggling with the writing, I would identify um, over this next week three blocks of time that you are going to purely dedicate to the creation of content. Um, I would come up with the ideas that you are going to create the content of before you sit down. So do this at a separate time. Plan out how you will use those three blocks of time. Maybe three, maybe five, it may be one. Um, think about before you sit down, what are you going to do? Because sometimes that, that idea, the honing and the refining of the idea is the thing that stops us from the creating. So identify it, set yourself a goal. In this session, I'm going to write about this topic. You may even want to say, I'm going to publish it at this time as well, um, just to give yourself a bit of a deadline. One of the things I find helpful is to um, change things up. Um, during those sessions. If I'm really struggling, um, sometimes if, if I'm able to, I will go to a cafe with my laptop and I'll sit down there. Sometimes just the change of scenery can be useful. Sometimes it's changing the style of the content that you're gonna write. So if you write a lot of how-to content, maybe, maybe to get you going, you wanna write a story post or an opinion post or a news post or a list post or something a bit different to what you're used to. And doing that can sometimes 
kind of get the creative sparks flowing. Maybe you want to do a, instead of a written post, you want to do an audio post or a video post. So changing things up can sometimes just get you through that initial stage of creating. Um, um, what else can I say? Um, think about your audience. Um, one of the, the things I, someone actually said to me really recently is, um, and I was what I was saying to them is actually let me let me kind of cycle back. Uh, one of the things I've been struggling with lately is creating written content, um, and one of the things that's stopping me from doing that is that I feel like I've almost written everything there is to write about on my topic. I've been doing pro bloggers since two thousand four. I've written a lot of content, and I f- kind of feel like I've covered most of the bases. Um, and so I was telling my friend. I'm struggling to create new content because I feel like it's all been written. And he says, well, you do these Facebook lives where people ask you questions and you seem really energized and and that seems to give you um, energy and you seem fine with that. Um, Why can you do that when you can't write content? Because um, he was watching my Facebook live the other day and I was answering questions that I'd answered before and that I'd written about before. And the thing that I realized is that the reason I find this so easy is that I know on the other side of this camera, on the other side of the world, in Texas and India and Egypt, there are real people right now with a problem who need an answer. There's people out there with a challenge and they need um, the, the resources, they need the motivation, they need the inspiration, they, they need the information. And, and so what I realize is that one of the things that, is going to help me with written content is to put myself in the position of thinking about who's on the other side of the words a bit more and to actually visualize them and to know their names and to hear their questions and to have chatted to them. Those types of things are going to help me. And so if you're struggling to create content at the moment, one of the things I think that can really help is to remind yourself that there's a real person who's going to read that content. And that they probably have a question or a challenge or a problem or a situation that you can have a direct impact upon. And so I think the more we can get into touch with understanding that there are human beings on the other side of our cameras and our words and and our um, podcasts, that use that, let that spur you into action. Um, so it may be that you want to take a question that a reader has asked and to write a personal response to them. What, one of the things I, I um, realized a few years ago is that some of my best blog posts started out as me sending an email back to a reader who asked me a question. Uh, and, and I realized that I'd written something in that email that was useful. And so I turned that into a blog post. So, yeah, I don't know whether that helps in any way, but really tap into who is reading your blog. And and if you want to, just write a post to to one of your readers. You may change it a little bit later to make it applicable to everyone, but um, really tap into those questions. So I've just taken a lot of time to answer that question, Jason. I hope you're still there. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Bagor says, what do you think is the best way to approach... Um, guest blogging. Uh, I mean, things became tougher today. You might have written the second half of a question and a lot of blogs are not open to guest posting. So how do you go about it? Yeah, so a lot of bloggers don't have guest posts anymore. We used to take a lot of guest posts on ProBlogger. We don't do it anymore. Um, we've really pulled back the amount of content that we're producing and focusing more on the quality of the content that we're producing um, and keeping a lot more of it in-house. And, and that's pretty common. Um, so really the best guest posters, um, guest posts come out of relationships. So the more you can get to know other bloggers, the better. Um, And it's usually out of those relationships that people will invite you to write on their blog. Um, Yeah, it's it's really is much harder today. And and I would be focusing a lot of attention upon um, trying to get to know other bloggers in your niche. I don't know if that really helps that much, but um, it's going to take some time. Pardon me. Um, Hi, Leah from Singapore here. Um, When choosing an article to link to for more historical or current events, uh, i.e. COVID, 
Is it better to link to a well-written Wikipedia page or to a news site like CNN, Time, BBC? And thinking about credibility and neutrality. Yeah, um, I think really it's about trying to find the best quality information. Um, And if that happens to be on Wikipedia, then that's great. If it happens to be on a news site and you think it is well-balanced and neutral, then that. Um, It's really probably about you doing the research and the due diligence for your readers to to actually work out what you are linking to and if it is good. Um, You've got to do that work yourself um, and and use your judgment. Um, I don't think there is a particular site that um, anyone, uh, everyone in the world is going to think is neutral. Everyone in the world is going to think that some site has some sort of an agenda and and maybe they're right and maybe they're not. Even Wikipedia, you know, a lot of the the posts on Wikipedia, there's probably a bit of an agenda behind some of them by the author and the authors that have created them. And so um, you've got to be a little bit careful there as well. Um, I'm not sure there's, um, there's ever going to be a perfect site to link to, unfortunately. So yeah, do your your best judgment um, and maybe try and find a few links that um, argue different sides of something um, as well. It's a tricky one, particularly on issues of health. Um, you know, there's there's you you really do have to do that due diligence for your readers' um, uh, sake. Uh, Marie, nice to see you. If you have an iPhone, uh, use dictation. I'm building my content this way and it works. Yes. So when someone was asking about writer's block um, before, that is actually something that I have done. Um, When I have struggled to write something, sometimes I have recorded it and then got it transcribed or then use that recording as a kind of jumping off point. Uh, for my writing as well. So that that might be useful as well. Any advice for using Medium in conjunction with your blog, Um, says Michael. Um, Good question. Um, Medium, the benefit of Medium is that it's got a huge audience uh, of people, of readers. And so it's a great place to put content to get in front of readers that you may not have been in front of. Um, the problem is that it's um, anytime you put content up there, it's probably going to outrank the content on your own site in Google. And so um, you don't want to put the same content on your blog as on Medium um, because it will rank outrank you um, every time and it will signal to Google that maybe you're a duplicate of the Medium article. So if you are going to put the same kind of content in two places, I would post it first on your blog and then rewrite it for Medium, um, or write something for Medium that is very broad, and then link from it to your blog on something specific. So you wanna find a way to make it different, and to give people a reason to come across from Medium into your particular blog. Um, So think about the type of content that you share. Um, The content that does well on Medium tends to be those big mega list posts and and something that's maybe a bit controversial or something that's really fresh and new, um, something that summarizes a big topic, something that's written in a personal voice. So those types of content can go really well on Medium, but always think about how can I link back into my blog for something more specific, maybe something more actionable, something that people can get for free in some way, those types of links can be good. Um, You also want to be a bit careful about how you link to yourself as well. You don't want to be too, you know, come over and sign up for my free course or, you know, you don't want to make it too opt-in-ish. You want to make it genuinely useful that people end up on your site. Um, Use Medium to build your credibility to get in front of new people, but then deliver the real actionable stuff over on your own blog. I hope that kind of helps. I've only really used Medium a little bit, so um, I'm sure there are other people watching who might have a little bit more to say on that. Uh, Corey, nice to see you, Corey. Um, Corey says, G'day, I promised several weeks ago to report uh, on using StreamYard for our streaming. It's great. Really loving it, and we can then download the recording and use it for other locations like LinkedIn and YouTube too. It's a great product. Excellent. 
Um, I've heard many people talking um, uh, about StreamYard and uh, so I'm glad to hear it's working well for you. One of the things I love about Ecamm, which is what I use, is that it also allows us to record the content. So at the end of this video, there will be um, automatically a uh, video recording of this video put into a folder which I have go straight into Dropbox and then I could upload that or I could cut it up and put little snippets of it up into my blog or onto YouTube as well. So I'm great, glad to hear that Corey. Um, I actually was wondering how it had gone for you. Okay. Let me see, oh, we've got Darren's comment back up there. I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, sorry, speaking of systems, I'm using a Stream Deck for the first time. Have you, if you follow me on Instagram, um, you might have seen that I'm using a Stream Deck now. I've been renovating my desk. And so um, the Stream Deck has been quite useful for that. But for some reason, there we go. I've got these scenes loaded up and for some reason, one of the scenes isn't quite working today. Anyway, Barb, your question was next in line. Thanks for all the questions today, this is fantastic. Barb says, what's better to put a course on my own website or to just use Teachable? Um, <laughs> there's a case for using both. <laughs> um, one of the benefits of using other people's systems is you don't have to build your own system. Um, and some of the course, some of the places, and I don't know if Teachable is one of them, um, might get your course in front of other people as well. I don't know if Teachable does that, if they've got a library of all the courses, that might be one of the benefits. Um, I don't know. It probably is going to come down to ease of use and how willing you are to build your own system and um, create an area for courses on your site. So um, one thing that I know a lot of people do is they actually use um, tools like Teachable and some of the other course creation tools. They upload there, they start there, and once they've got proof of concept, they then use it on their own blog. Um, some people do both as well. Um, I haven't used Teachable myself, so um, I'm struggling to answer really there because I don't know the advantages of using Teachable, I'm sorry. Um, but I will have a, a bit of a look at that and see what I can come up with. David says, I'm a nurse but want to create a um, nursing site. Uh, not about nursing, but finances for nurses. Worries, it's a little of a niche, too much of a niche. There's about 3.8 million nurses out there, but not as many are interested in um, finance. Um, I actually kind of like that idea, David. Um, kind of reminds me of um, nerd fitness. You know, it's a fitness blog for nerds. Um, so you're thinking about doing a finance blog for nurses. Um, you could broaden it, I guess, a little to do finance blog for medical professionals. Um, so then you've got doctors and osteos and physios and all kinds of other health practitioners. That might be a way to broaden it. But I kind of like the idea of, of something that focuses upon a demographic and a niche topic. Uh, I would explore it. I, I like that idea and you know there's there might be 3.8 million nurses out there but I reckon internationally there might be more than that um, yeah I, I kind of like that give it a go um, and you you could broaden it um, I guess it depends how much there is to say to them if, if then if there's a lot of products out there and, and um, strategies that you can write that are specific to nurses then I think that could be really useful and that could be really attractive for nurses as well. So yeah, I, I, my gut reaction is that that's a kind of a cool idea. Hillary says, how do you record with reflections from your glasses? I have uh, a blue light filter on mine and I can't work it out. So yes, a few things I can say about that. Those anti-glare reflective coatings on your glasses um, are definitely one thing that helps a little. Um, now, if 
you might see there the reflections that kind of do have that bluish greenish tinge to them so that helps a little bit the best thing though is the position of the light and so you can probably tell here that this light um, which is my key light is not directly in front of me if i was to put this light and i might be able to move it if i put this light right in front of me you're going to see it in my eyes a lot more, particularly if it was a little bit lower. But I've got it on an arm that I can actually put it out to the side. And now I've got it in a slightly different position to where it was. That's why I've got to get my lighting back. Um, but having it off to your side means that you will only see the reflections when you look directly out at, in that direction. And I'm looking at you in the camera there. Um, so doing it with one light can be useful. Um, the downside is that this side is now a little less bright. I do have another light up behind me. It's a hair light, um, <laughs> which I find very amusing. And I chuckled to myself when I was setting it up. It lights this part. You can kind of see a little bit of glint there. If I had hair, it would look great, um, but it sheens there. So I can't have that light too bright or, or else it kind of really gets too bright. Um, so yeah, um, one thing that I sometimes do is have this light here and another one sort of off to the side here so I can light both sides of my face. Um, the bigger and the more diffused the light is, that's the other factor as well. If this light, um, and let me kind of show you what I've got. I'm gonna, you can see that light over there. Um, that is the, um, it's an LED light and it's got a diffuser box on it and that softens the light. I hit the back um, bit of my <laughs> camera, the play button, so um, it showed the latest photo that was taken of my son. <laughs> He's gonna, he would hate that. <laughs> That's quite funny. So what I was saying is the more diffused the light is, the less, um, less harsh it is in your glasses as well. So because this is diffused, it kind of is softer. And so even when I do reflect on it, you can, it's not like a really hard circle there in the glasses. Um, I am expecting some new lights actually. Um, there's a company called Godox, um, which creates lights and they've got these um, beautiful lights. I can't remember the actual model number, but I'll show them in a video um, in, the, in the coming weeks. And they have this huge, like a big diffuser. Um, and so it's going to be even bigger. Um, it's double the size of the ones I've got and that will soften the light even more and it will create a light that lights both sides of my face a little bit more as well, wraps around a little bit more and it should diffuse it even more than I've got at the moment. So diffusion, it's about the position and um, yeah, they're the main things. I hope that helped Hillary, but it is a pain. Um, and every time I get the chance to um, talk to a news presenter or a celebrity who's on television that wears glasses, I ask them what kind of glasses they have, what kind of reflective coating, um, because that certainly can help. Um, but yeah, it's more about the lights and the position of them as well. Okay, Claire, good to see you. Uh, good to see you live again. How often do you think we should post blog articles? I notice that you post on ProBlogger once a week. Should a new blogger post more often? There's definitely advantages of posting more often, particularly in the early days of your blog. It builds up your archives. The more content you've got on your blog, the more doorways into your blog that you have. So yes, in the early days, I would encourage you if you can, and if it's not going to decrease the quality of what you do to publish more often. Um, and once you've got a lot of content there in your archives, like we've got thousands of articles on ProBlogger now, we spend more time kind of updating those older articles and um, interacting with our audience um, because there's more benefit in that for us. Hey, Monica from Montreal. We are well here in Australia. I hope you are well in Montreal as well. Um, you're welcome, Helia. Gonna whip through some of these questions here. Hey there from Nigeria, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us today. 
Um, Kimba, nice to see you as well. I will check out your URL after the uh, broadcast is over. Um, absolutely. I can't remember exactly why you said absolutely, Helia, but uh, thanks for watching. Okay, so Denise says, can you talk about how you use other people for support, brainstorming, feedback, and accountability? Sometimes it really helps to spark a bit of confirmation from others for motivation. Yes, I agree. So I have a, a team that I employ these days to help me with my blogs, um, which certainly is helpful. Um, so paying people to do particular roles. In the early days of my blogs, I didn't have anyone. Um, in fact, for 10 or so years, I didn't have anyone apart from occasionally I would hire someone to do some moderation work um, with comments. Um, and so if back then, it was really important that I spent a lot of time interacting with other bloggers. And so I had, um, there were probably two or three bloggers that we kind of formed a little I don't know what to call it. It was kind of like a, a mastermind alliance brainstorming group. Um, it wasn't formal in any way, but we had a little, I can't even remember what we used. It was some sort of a chat group, but it was before there was Facebook groups. Um, and, and we used to, it might have been email even, and we used to just check in with each other and give each other uh, feedback on the content that we'd written. Uh, if we had a post that we were writing, but we couldn't come up with a title, we would um, say, hey, this is what I've written. Can you think of a title for me? And we'd brainstorm those sorts of things. If we were out of ideas of things to write, we would um, come up with ideas for each other. Our blogs kind of related to each other, but they weren't exactly the same. So they overlapped and, and that enabled us to promote each other's content a little bit, um, to guest post on each other's blogs. So I guess be on the lookout for those kinds of relationships um, with other people. Um, and I've seen in our Facebook group, the Pro Blogger Facebook group, we, we see people um, regularly team up as buddies um, and f have formed mastermind groups and, and those sort of relationships as well. So yeah, I think it's really important to have th those kind of relationships um, naturally, um, but as your blog grows, you may hire people to help with that as well. Um, just a blogging buddy, even if it's just one other person, can be a really powerful thing to have. Even if it's just, let's do this for the next three months um, and see how it goes. And if it doesn't work, three months, it's not that long. Um, and then it may actually grow into something bigger. And you may actually find that you need three or four people or, or just one other person's enough for you. Uh, hey, Denise, uh, in Washington, D.C., nice to uh, have you joining us today. Uh, Jason, I'm glad that that <laughs> kind of long collection of thoughts actually uh, was useful to you. Um, Christine from Alberta, Canada, and I'm an academic blogger of, um, of the blog Valentine uh, Academy. Acad my brain is not working. I'm wondering about etiquette for guest posting. I secured my first guest post, uh, guest blog post, and I'm wondering what an appropriate call to action would be at the end of the post. Is it expected that I would link to my own site? Yes. So, yes, it is expected that you would link. Generally, when you guest post, there will be a link to your site. So, um, and it will depend a little upon the blog that you're on. So, you want to negotiate that with the blogger and just say, hey, I'm just be upfront. I'm not really sure how you do this on your blog, um, but I'd love to link back to my blog. Um, how do you suggest to do that? Some bloggers like to do that right up front, and sometimes the blogger will introduce your post, and they'll say, today we have um, Christine, um, who's going to sh from this blog, and they'll link to it there. Sometimes it's at the bottom of the post. Um, if and, and this is probably the most effective thing that you can do if the blog is open to it. If there's something in your guest post that relates to something you've written on your blog, um, link to that in a natural way. Only if it's re relevant, only if it's useful, um, only if it gives something extra that you can um, kind of um, build upon from what you've written about in the article, the guest post. That is the, is the kind of link that people are much more likely to go and visit um, than just a, this is Christine from this blog link. Um, 
Some bloggers will like you to add a little bio at the end. Christine is from Alberta, Canada. She blogs at, um, she has four, four dogs and a budgie. Um, you know, th they like that type of thing. So really it's about trying to negotiate that with the blogger. Find out what they've done in the past. Maybe go back and dig in their archives and see what they've done in the past. And, and that might give you a bit of a format as well. But yes, generally you would be linking back to your site. Okay, I'm gonna scroll down through some of these comments and find some questions. Thank you for everyone uh, who has asked questions today. There's some, been some really good ones today. Um, what do you think about moderating and curating content on blogs? Um, thanks for the question. It depends a little what you mean by that. So curated content is something that um, some may not be familiar with and it does mean a little bit of different things to different people. For some people that means creating a blog post that is you introduce a topic and then say here's three links that I found on the web where you can read that further. That's kind of curation of content. Um, and that's totally fine. Um, and that can be really useful for your readers. And that can be a kind of an easy post for you to put in, um, in between some of your longer form content. Um, some people take it a step further and they actually use the content that they've curated on their blog in different ways. And this can be where the, the sort of ethical questions come into it. If you are using someone else's full blog post on your blog. That's a no-no unless you've got permission. And so you don't want to curate all of their content to your blog. If you're going to use a quote from their blog, that's generally okay as long as you link back to the source of the content. And so that can be useful. Um, if you are using their YouTube video on your blog, that's okay because YouTube allows the content creators on YouTube to um, tick whether they want their content to appear on other sites or not. And so if they don't want you to use that content, they would have ticked that box. So you can embed their video on your blog. That's totally fine. Um, same goes with Instagram posts and tweets and um, any kind of social media status where you can embed content. Um, generally, that's okay as well. Um, as long as you're clear about where you got the content, who it is, whose it is, you're not trying to hide that in any way. Um, if you can find where their website is, I would encourage you to link to that and give them a little bit of link love. Um, that type of approach is useful. Um, the other thing I should say about curated content is if you, do, if you only ever do curated content, if you only ever use other people's content, it's going to probably be harder for you to grow your blog. There are blogs out there that do it really well and they grow an audience, but if all you ever do is just post videos from other people or Instagram posts from other people or um, you know quotes from other people, it's, it is harder to grow your audience, so you want to be a bit careful about that. I hope I kind of understood your question there, T-Polls, um, and answered it okay. Um, Kate from Seattle, I'm wondering if you have tips integrating YouTube videos into blog posts. How can each platform best complement work with each other? I hope that makes sense. Yes, I, I actually think this is a real opportunity for bloggers. Um, video creation is, is a wonderful thing and video is the, that area, that medium of content that has grown so much in the last five or so years. Um, and so if you can create video content and embed that into your blog, Either that's the, your blog post, you, you might have a paragraph, there's your video, and then that's it. Or if you can have a video that adds to content on your blog, so you might write an article on how to cook um, Anzac biscuits. I don't know if you know what Anzac biscuits is because you're from Seattle, but it's an Australian kind of biscuit, golden syrup and oats, beautiful. Um, so if you had a recipe for that, Actually creating a video of you making the Anzac biscuits and embedding that in with your recipe, that's so much more useful for someone who finds the recipe. So yes, I think um, that's really good. And of course you would have the video on YouTube as well. So you're serving a different audience there and, and that's a search engine as well. So it helps people to find um, your, your audience. And then you could actually use that video clip on 
on Instagram perhaps as well, um, little clips of it. And you maybe you could um, put that video up onto Facebook as well. So yes, there are different ways of doing that. And I have frozen on the screen and I don't know if I'm live anymore. I'm doing this. Um, can you actually see me? Can you hear me? Hmm. Why have I frozen? Let me just go to this screen, which is terrible, and unplug the, oh, this might kill my audio. Am I back? Can you hear me? I'm sorry, I dropped out then. You can hear me? I don't know what happened then. Uh, it was just like I cut out or something. I don't know whether you could keep hearing my audio through that. Or anyway, I can see Reva says I'm back. So I'm glad. Um, did I drop out? Where did I drop out? Um, Kate, did I answer your question? <laughs> I can see people now talking about Anzac biscuits in the comments. Um, and Kevin says Anzac biscuits are a Kiwi tradition too. Of course, yes. Uh, Anzac biscuits um, being Anzac being Australian New Zealand Army Corps. We must have cooked them together at Gallipoli or something like that, I guess. All right. Okay. So I hope that answered your question, Kate. Um, Um, where are we at with these questions? Okay, Denise, thanks for your practical response. I love your confident and sincere delivery of valuable experience and insight. You're welcome, Denise. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, Facebook user, this is someone in the Facebook group. Apologies that I don't know your name because um, Ecamm can't pull in your name. So if you want to add in your name and let me know who you were, then that, that's wonderful. But I can see that you've asked this question and said, so good to hear from you. That is nice. Is it good to link to other articles you write like older articles? Yes, it is very important. Um, one, it will drive more page views. Two, it will build your brand. If someone reads one article and then they're going to read another one, then they're much more likely to come back to your site. Three, it does help a little with your search engine optimization. Google likes interlinked sites. They like to be able to follow links. And if they end up on your site, then that can help a little bit there. So yes, I would do that. Um, in fact, every article you write, I would just ask the question, have I written something that relates to this that I could link to at the end of the article? So yes, I would do that. Uh, Kevin says, I'm enjoying listening from Thailand again. I have a question. How do I plan content for my blog that I can later compile into a book? Good question. Um, how can we answer this? Um, I think there's probably a few approaches there that people take. Some bloggers for their book will just look through their archives and find articles they've written and then use them in their book. And in some ways, that's what we did with the ProBlogger book. Um, when I wrote a lot of the content for our ProBlogger book, I didn't know I was writing a book. I thought I was writing blog posts. And then we took a lot of those articles and, and kind of tweaked them and re rewrote them a little bit. But a lot of the content is actually based on articles in the, in the blog post. Um, the other option, I guess, is if you know you're writing a book, is to actually outline the chapters of your book, to outline the sections of those chapters, and then to um, start writing them as blog posts um, that you know you will use. Um, so yeah, I think um, I think doing that is useful. So one of the exercises that we've talked about on ProBlogger before is, um, and I mentioned it earlier in this video, is actually thinking about the, the change you're trying to bring in your audience. So I'm taking them from point A to point B. That's the overall change. Then you break that change down. So um, for digital photography school, um, we our goal is to take someone who's got a brand new digital camera who doesn't know how to use it, and to get them out of auto mode and to get full creative control of their camera. That's the overall goal. And so that might be the overall goal of your book as well. 
And so then it's about breaking down. What do they need to know to get out of automatic mode? Well, they need to learn how to hold their camera. They need to learn how to turn it on. They need to learn how to, uh, what the different modes on their camera are. They need to learn all these things and gradually you're able to fill in the gaps and take them on that complete journey. So that's a useful exercise to do for a blog, but also an exercise that you could do for your book. And then you could just use that plan for both. Um, I don't know if that helps. Okay, uh, I can see everyone saying that I'm not frozen anymore and that I'm back. I'm glad. All right, I've been on this live for a while now, so I am not going to be here for much longer. It's been over an hour. I'm going to answer the last couple of questions that are coming in. Um, so if you've got any last questions, pop them in. Debarco, nice to see you. How to increase sales of products using a blog? Basically, any tips on running shops? Uh, of some products and enhancing the conversion. Um, so one of the best things you can do if you are selling a product, a physical product, for example, is to demonstrate how to use it to, um, and a good example of this is Stream Deck. So before I bought the Stream Deck, I actually went onto YouTube. And on YouTube, I found the Stream Deck um, site. And the Stream Deck site had an article on uses for the Stream Deck that aren't just about live streaming. And um, so I don't know if you really are interested, but you can actually set up on your Stream Deck. There we go. Shortcuts. So I can actually set. Um, so this one here is uh, press that button. It opens up my calendar. This one here is my Philips Hue lights in the background. I can actually change those on that. So anyway. That was really useful content. It was on YouTube, it wasn't on a blog, but you could do the same sort of content on a blog. How to use a product. Um, that increases the chances that someone's gonna be sold on the product as well. And so that might be one thing that you could do. First thing that came to my mind, I hope that kind of helps. Um, and frequently asked questions about products or other articles. Um, this product versus this product type articles can work quite well as well because people, when they're trying to work out, do I buy that one or that one, search for that. So if you can be on the end of that search term, that can help as well. And those are the types of things that come to mind on that. Um, Debaco, another question there. Um, what would you suggest setting up a domain and setting up your own blog or start on a pre-existing blog platform? Um, depends. <laughs> um, ideally, you want to be on your own domain. Ideally, you want complete control of your blog. But... If you are just starting out and you don't know how long you're going to be at it, you just want to test out blogging, um, you may not be overly technical and that might be a challenge for you. You might want to see if there's any kind of uptake and people reading your blog before you invest too much time and energy. I think they are, all, they are some of the um, benefits of starting on a blog tool like WordPress.com um, or Blogger or any of the others that are out there. Um, they can give you a start, they can give you a taste, and you can also, in most cases, put them on your own domain later. But it's a bit of a process to get them from where they were to where they are. And so if you think you're going to be at it for the long term, if you do have a little bit of time or money to invest, I think it's worth doing it properly right up front. And we have our free um, course on doing that. Uh, at ProBlogger, our starter blog course that walks you through how to get the hosting, how to get the domain, and how to get the WordPress up onto those things. And it really isn't that hard to do. Um, yeah, so check out the free course uh, on that one. Um, actually, I saw this question before. Nick says, will we do another seminar on ProBlogger? So I, th um, I think you're probably talking there about our live events, I think. Um, obviously this year is going to be tough for us to do that, um, but we do have some courses, online courses coming up that we are working on at the moment, which have been based on previous live events that we've done. So um, stay tuned for that. And then I guess as things open up, we will consider it for next year as well. 
Uh, Andy says, love your podcast. Cool to see you on live. Nice to be seen on live. Um, Giddy says, new bloggers, how many posts a week should we be trying to complete? Really depends on your time availability and your energy for it. Um, regular content is really important. Um, I, I think early on, if you can do a little bit more and then slow down as you've got content, your archives can be useful. If you can handle three or four or seven or 10 a week uh, without decreasing the quality, then that's good. But if you're, um, every extra post you do is gonna decrease the quality of them, then I would just do one a week. Um, so yeah, it's really gonna depend a little on your capacity to create content. But the more regular you can get in the early days, the better, because you'll be creating more doorways into your site. Okay, that, Kind of looks like the end of the questions. Thanks so much for watching. Um, it has been nice to be with you today um, and to play around with my little stream deck and the new microphone and that type of thing. Um, and I should also say the reason I haven't been on this week is that my internet was completely down for um, about five days. Uh, and so I was hot spotting off my phone. It was a pain in the butt. So it's nice to be back not to drop out and uh, and to see you all as well. Uh, as I said earlier in the video, I'm thinking of you all in, and thinking of our world at the moment and uh, I hope that you are well and safe and look forward to chatting with you next week. And I'm going to say goodbye now. now I'm gonna play my little outro music and then uh, I will disappear. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to ProBlogger. If you'd like to comment on any of today's topics or subscribe to the series, find us at problogger.com forward slash podcast. Tweet us at ProBlogger. Find us at facebook.com forward slash ProBlogger or search ProBlogger on iTunes.